Yeah. 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 Yeah.
and my once healthy children is disheartening. These are all issues we did not have at the start of all this crazy pandemic and seem to disappear with every break the kids have from school. You don't see every day what my children are going through mentally, physically, emotionally, and medically. Therefore, it is not your decision or right to decide what is best for them. All we are asking for is our freedom of choice to do what we feel is best for our children's individual needs. Our freedom we are taking away unlawfully. I would end with a thank you, but thank you for what? Not listening to the pleas of the peanut gallery, not listening to our concerns, not allowing us to make a decision for the children that we have birthed and raised since day one, or maybe thanks for contributing to the de deterioration of the physical and mental health of the children, my children. Mm -hmm. So I'll thank those on the board that are fighting and listening to the peanut gallery. And hopefully you will see that every child is different and has different needs. It's not a one size fits all case. Thank you. Kelly Palmer. Hi, my name is Kelly Palmer. It's spelled K-E-L-L-Y, T-A-L-M-E-R, nine from Mont Seagull. Um, you have noticed that at these meetings, the amount of parents and concerned citizens, of course, has decreased. But it's not because we've given up our concern. It's not because we gave up our fight. We're still here. We're still strong. But we just realized that we had to take different avenues. Tens of thousands of people across the state have realized that it is litigation that will finally get us where we need to go. So I want to ask the board members here, no matter how you feel about masking or politics being on our children's faces, you please at least think about the financial side of this. Think about the tens of thousands of dollars that are being spent to justify these mandates that were found unconstitutional in court yesterday. You know, when PA 87 went through, we were told that these mandates would not be rescinded, even though it was required by PA 87, because by opinion, it was unconstitutional. So that tells me that the people here on this board and our health director do care about things being unconstitutional. So since we now know that the powers that were given to our health director were declared unconstitutional, I'm going to thank you right now so much for rescinding your mandates because I know you would never want to do something unconstitutional and you would never want to waste all of our taxpayer dollars to keep defending something that is wrong and unlawful. So thanks. Thank you. Stephanie Jacobson. My name is Stephanie Jacobson. I'm from Otsego County as well. And we are now almost two years into 15 days to flatten the curve. Um, as for the mask mandate, we've never seen any sort of goal um, or benchmark, and, and not that that would make it right or scientific, but we've never seen anything. And your counsel at the last meeting, a, a gentleman on the Zoom advised you that that might be a good idea. So people actually understood what we're trying to accomplish here. Because all of us still in this room, just due to our age and probably our comorbidities, have a much higher risk of having severe COVID than our children, who have mercifully been spared from this. Um, we know now, where, what else do we know? We know the vaccines don't work. We're now on our third booster with no end in sight. Um, we realize we can't vaccinate our way out of COVID, even though you guys might not. We're going to have to learn to live with it. We know that natural immunity seems to be holding and community immunity that you get by getting the vaccine is something you all made up. We know that masks don't work, at least not the kind that we've been wearing. Um, and we just saw Fauci pivot on this because now everybody's parroting that we all need N95 masks, something that many of us pointed out two years ago or whatever. We know masks on children makes the least sense of all due to their risk. Um, and that's been the same through the pandemic. We know hospitals are not use, using known therapeutics to treat COVID. They're waiting till people get very, very sick. And then they put them in the hospital and most of them don't make it out. Um, we know other countries are using these therapeutics with much success. Um, we also know hospitals are getting paid to do this because they're getting a lot of money for each COVID patient that follows the protocols. We know the CDC lies. They're not discerning between dying with COVID and dying of COVID. Um, they just admitted that. Um, in relation to children. They're not discerning between children that enter the hospital with COVID and children that enter the hospital because of COVID. 
we know that we should have protected the vulnerable, get early treatment, and we should have at least told people to get healthy because people with far more comorbidities are the ones that are dying with COVID. Um, when the Supreme Court justice doesn't understand this and is citing wrong statistics, and she's supposed to be the most learned person in the land, then we've got a problem. And now you want health professionals, mental health counselors, social workers to deal with the terrible consequences of lockdown on our children. I bet you do, you authority. Thank you, Ms. Jacobson. Is there any other public comment? Yes, ma'am. Um, Your name and sure. My name is Mary. My last name is Moore, and I'm a I'm a county taxpayer. I just want to take a minute to talk about your the two minutes of talking time. Um, I had the same problem when I heard uh, <laughs> uh, Justice Sotomayor say, you know, a hundred thousand kids are sick with COVID in the hospital and on ventilators. I thought, oh my goodness, our public officials are not informed as informed about this pandemic, the treatments for it. The, the, the real statistics, the real data, as many of us. So I think the two minutes needs to be expanded in some way. I would, as a, as a member of your constituency, I would feel much more comfortable about your decisions if you were bringing in experts from both sides of the aisle to talk about some of the issues involved. If you could bring in somebody to talk longer than two minutes about masking and what it really does. If you could bring in somebody for longer than two minutes to talk about the hospital protocols that I have a big issue with. I believe that we could have saved a lot of people with early treatment. And there's a lot of good evidence out there that that's true. And they're not from fringe epidemiologists the way that uh, Dr. Fauci describes, um, you know, the Stanford, uh, Oxford, and Harvard guys who had really good ideas that we should have followed when this pandemic started. So back, circle back, the two minutes to talk, to bring in other people to educate you guys is not enough. I would implore you to let some of these um, uh, uh, board members bring in experts so that you don't have the embarrassment of our own health department making statements like Justice Sotomayor, um, and I watch the Supreme Court because I'm trained as a lawyer. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Moore. Anyone else? <laughs> Hearing none, public comment is now closed. Many examples. You have the, let me find it, give me a second. Um, the 2022 calendar as proposed. Traditionally, our meetings are the first Tuesday of the month, um, and those are highlighted in blue. The regular bill pay meeting is the 15th, and it gets pushed if it's on the weekend. It's earlier if it's on Saturday. It's later if it's on Sunday. And then program and evaluation committee needs to meet to determine dates and times. Um, programs and committees has been working on uh, bylaws, rules, uh, ethics, etc., and haven't had seems like uh, one meeting so far since December. Um, so we'd like to see something that was um, more consistent. In addition, um, Emmett County, you all received a letter from Emmett County that indicated they are down to two members that can serve at this time. Um, for the remainder of the year. Unfortunately, one of those members cannot get here until 4.30, which would eliminate for one year membership from Emmett of one member. Um, Scott spoke at our last meeting. I spoke to him since. Um, he does rough. He indicated that at our last meeting. He indicated that evenings were not ideal for him. Um, it may eliminate him from three to four meetings uh, per year. Uh, but it does not eliminate him from representing from Charter Boy County. So the proposed motion is to uh, modify the time. It would still be the first Tuesday, and it would uh, we would start the meeting at 4:30 the first Tuesday of each month. 
There's another option available um, in regards to programs. Um, so I'll float that and see if anybody has anything to say about it. We could still do a regular meeting the first Tuesday, regardless of the time. And because the um, bylaws and those type of activities that they're talking about and restructuring, um, we could do that as a work session one month and then the next month do a business meeting. Next month we do a full work group to work on those. I don't know how, Jaris, you're the chair of that. If that's something that you're interested, it gives us structured time. It was just proposed, so I'm putting it out there. Um, we set the time for the next meeting, which is supposed to be Monday. And the different boards that I'm on got their calendars reset at the beginning of the year. So I have a conflict coming up next week, but I think I think we need to talk about meeting times at the end of the work. I mean, we wanted to get something on the calendar. Mm -hmm. And I just didn't think through fully that a number of meetings, dates and times could be changed in my personal schedule. And I told the committee, I said, I don't necessarily have to be there, but I want to be there. So you're talking about a committee, though, right? Yeah. Well, you have the option of continuing working on that as a committee only, or you, we could do it as a board work session every other month and do business every other month. Or we could do committee prior to a meeting, um, you know, as a regular schedule. The only concern is getting that ability to get some dates put together so that, um, well, it's like herding cats, honestly, mm -hmm. trying to get everybody's schedule down to the same uh, and, and not overlap on another meeting that you've been assigned to is really difficult if you make that meeting every time the next time you meet. and. So I'm just looking for input on that. We don't have to decide on uh, the committee necessarily, but Rob. I, I think in this case for bylaws, I think the smaller group at this time to, to hammer out the details, probably it's gonna work the best. I think they just need to come up with a plan and present it to the board so that you know we, we have, we need to get this done and they know they, they need to get through this. So. It's, uh, I think they just need to get in, whether the next meeting is before the uh, meeting on the first or however they decide and hammer it out and, and get a uh, schedule. And so I, you know, I'm assuming it's probably gonna take more than one or two meetings to, mm -hmm. to build the bylaws, so. Um, I also talked to Julie. She is still, you know, willing to work with you guys on getting those bylaws and working with you and, and structuring those. That's the parliamentarian. Um, she has a lot of knowledge in different bylaws. She's also looked at other um, health departments. She's been contacted by other health departments just to um, help them on their stuff as well. Um, I don't know if you have a copy of Berrien County um, Health Department that was provided to or not. Um, she, she had made a comment that she had seen those and they were very well written. So I just want to toss that out to you guys. If you don't have a copy, that you get a copy of theirs. Um, so I think we I think we do, but I'll have to double check. We have like 10 different ones, so. Right, so I just like to keep that in mind that if we can work her into it, I think that'd be very helpful to you guys. So we'll let you, you're scheduled on Monday, but Jaris, you won't be able to make that meeting, but three other members, I know that Julia had indicated she had expected to be there. Um, she's excused from today and hopefully everything works out for, for Monday. Um, and if you could come up with a, a long, you know, several meeting schedule, that would be helpful. That's acceptable to everybody. Well, we still have the issue of uh, regular meetings, right? Yeah. Uh, that'll be, is that yep. something that we're going to work with now? Or? Yep. Yeah. That's my next item. Okay. <laughs> So I understand that, um, you know, Scott doesn't want to be eliminated. He doesn't want to be not appointed to this board. He did indicate that he would like to continue on the board. Um, the problem is if we um, 
if we don't change the meeting, we have effectively eliminated uh, one commissioner representation the entire year. Yeah, we literally have no alternatives. I mean, he made a comment, but I couldn't believe that was the case, but it really is the case. I mean, we are lucky to have commissioners uh, uh, work during the day. They're younger and it's, you know, it's um, just so everybody's aware, two of the members uh, from Emmett had previously resigned, so the, the pool is small. Uh, well, Madam Chair, I'm going to speak as a member of the Charlotte Wayne Board of Commissioners. I, I find it hard to believe that you're going to uh, change the time for one member without considering another member that, it, that has no objection with the current time. and. I also can't believe that Emmett County has seven members. They can't find more than two members that are willing to serve on this board. We we can't. Well, uh, that's, this, that's is your not, this is not a this is not a debatable point. Okay, but then why you should not change the schedule to accommodate in a county that does not have enough members willing to serve on this board. That's, I think I can, and I'm not going to speak for Shirley, but I do know I speak for a number of members of the Shelway County Board. That that's the way they see it. You're taking one member as a problem and basically removing another member that will have the same problem or losing income that he has contracted for. Uh, and he could make the same case. Talking to him, he has um, the potential to miss three or four is his where I, when I talk to him, I don't want to speak for him, but he does have some obligations through March, I believe. And then he's got November and December that he's got a potential to be roughing for those time frames as well. Um, you know, for me, 430 is not ideal for me. I, I would be opposed other than, um, you know, Charlotte Boy has an opportunity to potentially appoint someone different. And, and Scott has expressed he so, wants so to be Demma. on it. So Demma. But no, we don't. That is not a debatable point. Okay. Well. And so Charlotte Boy, everyone has, you know, days they can't come. And we know that in a meeting schedule each year. So, he it doesn't eliminate him from serving it just eliminates several meetings for him if we don't move it we eliminate emmett county from serving to one position and i'd like to see full representation rob can can we continue to have a uh, an alternate to fill in for for scott in the event uh, that from charlotte county that would have to be a decision of this board because it says an unusual circumstances. That could be an unusual circumstance. I think we're going to. And you guys are looking at that. I think that's something that we do have to talk about is, um, you know, what does when you get to those rules, unusual circumstances is that can be a whole range of things. And if you're appointing a different person, it shine the continuity and the education of the board um, decreases. So that's a concern. It does seem that the bylaws allow it. It does allow for unusual circumstances. Mm -hmm. And so if everybody is okay with an alternative, I would ask that we have a consistent alternative. Right. Where we add the county name, uh, one alternate to yes. fill in, in, in one's absence, right. I guess. And that way we have their name for the year and we know who that alternate would be. That would be a good idea. Can I get a consensus? Emmett, with... Antrim, and even on Seagull, we would have somebody that you would know that's already pre approved or on the list. And there, there are a couple other board of health when we looked at the bylaws that they state right at the beginning of the year the alternate for any circumstance is so and so. So it's not like this is unheard of. That's right. another option is having our new bylaws that you're going to the commissioner it has members and an alternate member. That's a good idea. Yeah, that'd be a good bylaw ditch. So are there any objections to considering a permanent alternate for unusual circumstances be established for each county? 
Madam Chair, Madam Chair, can, can you hear me? And that's Lisa, Lisa Bogler, our attorney. I just, I, I want to, I want to raise a, an issue. It, it would strike me as being difficult for the board to have consistency in what it's addressing month to month if we have, you know, changing people. Um, I, I think there's probably a reason why the bylaws say unusual circumstances so that there is that consistency in who, who the board of commissioners, uh, you know, by their own vote put on this board and what that person understands about what the board does month to month. So I, I'm raising a red flag about um, having an alternative individual and not knowing who's going to show up at any monthly meeting. I'd like to take an opportunity to ask Matt a couple of questions. And I'm, okay. I'm sorry, I have, I have a brand new laptop and unfortunately I, I'm not techy enough to ask whether or not it had a, a camera. So I have no camera in my new laptop. Um, but, but Matt, so week in and week out in your, in your school day, is your last period an active class or is there, I'm sorry. Scheduled to be at work at school from 8.15 until 3.40. Okay. So your, your last hour of the day, there's not an instance on any given day, Monday through Friday, where your last hour of the day might be. Uh, six periods when I, there are six periods when I, when I teach six periods a day. Okay. So. I'm just thinking from friends of mine who have who are teachers. Some sometimes they have a work hour, or I don't know what the correct term is. Um, but I don't. During we have staff at our school, and I teach six hours a day. So you have students in your in your classroom six hours a day. Well, for students from uh, eight fifty seven fifty to three fifteen, and then I contracted to be there at three forty, but I can leave like at three fifteen if I have to. Uh, okay. So if you can leave at 315 um, and provided there's not a snowstorm or, or other adverse weather conditions, um, the, the earliest you could appear at the health department offices you're sitting in right now would be about 345? I think that's unrealistic. I think it'd be more like four. Okay. So a, a meeting, could, instead of starting at 430, we could start a meeting at four and you could make that meeting. Yeah, if you'll give me till like 401, I can probably get there. <laughs> <laughs> All right. The proposal is for 430 to give that opportunity for drive time and whatnot. Yeah. Um, I understand Ms. Vogler's concern is that, so I'm not going to be there. I'm going to have somebody be there for me. Jairus can't be there the next. You know, it gets a little bit choppy at that point. Um, I think that has to be hashed out in the bylaws. But for this particular circumstance, and knowing that we have a member that has a particular issue with a referee schedule specifically, um, would the board be amiable to allow for Mr. Uh, Dreves to, to be that alternate to Scott specifically for the use for referee schedules for his conflict? It, and it's very specific for that conflict. Um, and then the bylaws can work out how that really would look and what it would be overall. Does that sound amiable to the rest of the board? Well, I want, I, I want Charlotte Boykai to be fully represented as much as I do them. And I mean, there's no question about that. And I'm confident that Mr. Graves can help. I mean, he is already doing it today and I, I'm, I am happier with the full group being here than any all. I don't want to want everybody to be in the room and have a productive discussion. Does the half hour from four to four thirty does that benefit anybody in particular? I know our staff. And by the way, never a Friday again because I didn't realize the day that this was going to fall on. Our staff was unfairly um, penalized there. On Friday to hang out with us. It's a huge sacrifice. We appreciate it. <laughs> Madam Chairman, I don't think you have a problem with Charlotte Roy at all. Because I was even asked if I would sit back and let somebody else. And I said, 
absolutely not, because <laughs> Mr. Uh, Jess, he would like to be also on the uh, health department. So we're looking at four of us. So we got Rob, myself, Rob, Jess, and Scott. So we don't have anything to worry about Charlotte Boy not being able to take care of their uh, position. They certainly can, and they're willing to do so. Okay. So 430 is amiable to everybody with that provision that um, that an alternate for Charlotte Boy be established to accommodate one member um, known schedule conflict. Right. Okay. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm good with it. I was just wondering, it seems like in previous years, we've set the meeting dates and times the first meeting in February. Are we doing that now or? We don't usually have a meeting in January. I so understand that. February, so I'd like to get this on the books and get it moved forward because it's our, everyone's setting up their schedules. That's why it was on the agenda. So I'm just, if I have a, I'm sorry, go I ahead. was just curious if, okay. if that's what we were doing or if we were just talking about it and going to do it next month. So uh, no, because I've got the staff relies upon our meeting schedule. And so that's a big factor in that as well. Um, and we but we are changing it for this year to accommodate for it. And it, next year is an election. Well, it'll be a new, potentially new board. And it might have an opportunity to have different membership that can accommodate a 9 a.m. or 10 a.m. Madam Chair, do we have Mr. Hankins' um, schedule? So we, in setting future dates, we can avoid the dates where he has conflicts? Well, I think we've solved that by Mr. Gray being available. Let me offer a motion so we can move on, and that would be that I move that the Board of Health establish uh, its monthly meeting to be at 4.30 p.m. on the first Tuesday of each month, and that counties shall be given the uh, opportunity to uh, provide a designated alternate as needed throughout the year. I didn't limit it to Charlevoix, but I mean, does that sound okay? Well, I'll second that. I'm sorry, what's the second? Thank you. So uh, 4.30, first Tuesday, allow for one alternate per county in event of unusual circumstances. It's been first and second. And is there any further discussion? I tend to agree with our attorney that, you know, having one without some definition of unusual, that, um, you know, I, I can't make it because my, I've got some conflict in my schedule. Is that unusual or because I have COVID that's an unusual? I think the definition of what we consider unusual would be, um, I think everybody here wants to serve. I hope everybody wants to serve and intends to show up for the meeting on a regular basis. Yeah, I think the counties can be trusted to make their own decisions. I mean, Scott obviously worked it up with his board and Mr. Graves, and I think that was, that's good enough for me. I mean, whatever their reasoning is, I'm sure they regard it as a good reason Scott is working, so. I'm just grateful that we can do this because this is going to help us a lot. Okay, roll call, please. Rola? Yes. Graves? No. McGinnis? Yes. Kuntz? Yes. Pallarito? Yes. Rubing? Yes. Argy? Yes. Motion passes six to one. Correct. Wait. Next item on my agenda. Sorry, I wasn't doing my pages. Litigation update. Just keep track if you could give us a litigation update as well as Ms. Bowler, who is on the phone. 
Yeah, I can start. And then um, if Lisa Bogler wants to jump in and clarify anything or add any additional details, she can. So, um, you know, the two lawsuits right now that are in, in place is the let first the let them breathe versus Health Department of Northwest Michigan and the Gaylord Community Schools. Um, we had a hearing in the Atsego County Circuit Court on December 17th, um, at which point the judge denied um, the preliminary injunction that had been filed by the plaintiff. Um, and at this point, there is another hearing um, supposed to be moving forward on February 7th. However, my understanding is that the plaintiff's attorney has not yet filed the documents needed. He had indicated he was going to file an amended complaint and has not done so. Um, both the health department and the Gaylor Community Schools have filed motions for summary disposition based on standing. And so at this point, um, we haven't heard anything more um, from, from the plaintiff's attorney and are, are planning on the, the hearing on February 7th. Lisa, do you want to add anything else about that one? Uh, no, um, I, I think your summary was accurate. We're uh, a little perplexed about um, the delay in the Atsigo case to the extent that the judge clearly ordered the attorney for the plaintiff to submit an order. Uh, that was a month ago. Um, <laughs> court rules require such an order to be submitted in seven days. Um, so uh, we are we are waiting for the hearing on February 7th. And in the Emmett County case, um, following the decision in Otsego, the attorney for the plaintiff um, uh, abandoned the idea of a preliminary injunction in the Emmett County case, and um, clearly seemed to understand that, um, that the identification of a named plaintiff was going to be required in the Emmett County case, much like the judge commented in the Otsego case. So we are we are in a holding pattern. Yeah, and I think that we mentioned at the last board meeting that the plaintiff had filed um, for an ex parte motion for a temporary restraining order, which was denied in the Emmett County case as well. And that case is called Concerned Parents of Emmett County versus Health Department of Northwest Michigan. So in a holding pattern, as Lisa said. So that's all I have on that. Does anyone have any questions? Okay. Staff reports, we're going to start with the health officer and you're going to go over some organizational training. Yeah. Um, I am going to try to share my screen. Well, typically in January, we um, provide an orientation to the Board of Health, and um, I have revised that orientation a little bit, given that many of you are, well, most of you have been here um, before, and so you're not brand new board members, but um, certainly it's an important role that you hold, and we want you to feel comfortable with it. So um, I am going to go through, sorry, I'm just, changing that to a full screen. I am going to go through this um, quickly for you. And if you have any questions, please feel free to stop me at any point. But, um, you know, I think it's really important for the board to have an understanding of everything the health department does. It's really important to us. We've changed the way we've, we've done things this year. And certainly our attention has been diverted in many different ways. Um, we don't hear from all of our directors at every meeting. And, and that's usually how we um, help to orient you to the, all the services that the health department provides. So um, just as an overview, our vision is to see healthy people in healthy communities. And our mission is to serve our entire community and to achieve health equity by promoting well-being, preventing disease, and protecting the environment through partnerships, innovation, and excellence in public health practice. So I have talked to you every meeting um, for most of this year about the 10 essential public health services. And we've tried to describe how our programs and services fall into these three major categories. So I won't go into detail today, but I know that wheel looks familiar to you as we've been sharing it throughout the year. And just the public health impact, um, you know, a lot of before the pandemic, most people, uh, you know, we spent a lot of our time trying to help the public remember what it is public health does. So it's often invisible, but um, you know, it's been a huge contributor to the increase in life expectancy that we've seen um, over the last century. 
And so because we have vaccination in children and adults, we don't see children and adults dying from infectious disease um, at those extremely high rates. It used to be the leading cause of death. Um, because we have um, policy changes that have required the use of helmets, seatbelts, work safety practices, we have less accidental deaths. Because we have clean drinking water and sanitary codes that help to keep it that way, we see less waterborne diseases. People have a longer life expectancy because they're not dying of, of dysentery and things like that in the United States. Because we inspect restaurants and provide education and um, care about restaurant policy and develop restaurant policy, we see less foodborne and related illness. And when we do see it, we're able to contain it very quickly due to the processes that public health um, implements during that time. Because we have seen so many improvements in policy changes related to tobacco control and new chronic disease screening and being able to move our prevention further upstream, we see less deaths from chronic disease. Because we work hard to be prepared for disaster, we have less vulnerability to disaster. We immediately were able to implement our incident command structure when the pandemic started and have been in that incident command structure for two years while maintaining all of the rest of the services that the public health department provides. Because we have an increased fluoridated public water supply, we see less dental caries in children, less cavities, which comes with a lot of different health impacts. So um, just as an overview of the public health structure in Michigan, we, it's different than other, some other states. We have a, a decentralized system. The state health department actually grants its authority to the local health departments and the local health departments act on its behalf. Our 83 counties in Michigan are served by 45 different local health departments. The difference between those two numbers um, lets you know that we have several district health departments that are partnerships between counties. And so, um, you know, that's, that's really important. You're one of those very long standing partnerships, maybe the oldest in Michigan. Um, the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services holds the state health department functions. We work very closely with Michigan Department of Health and Human Services and all of our programs. We have contacts and liaisons that we work together to make sure that public health is consistent across this decentralized system. The Michigan Association of Local Public Health is an entity that was organized in 1985 to serve as a, um, a representation for advocacy and um, be a liaison between the state agencies, the governor's office and the legislature and the 45 local health departments. So that's a, a nonprofit that is um, very important to us. All 45 health departments in Michigan have um, membership in that organization, um, the health officers of all 45 health departments serve as the board of directors of the Michigan Association of Local Public Health. And then just a reminder that the public health system is all of us. The public health system is not just the local health department. Um, we're all, we all play a role in ensuring the health of our communities, hospitals, human services providers, community agencies, schools, the media, employers, businesses, and every single one of us residents that lives in the public is a part of the public health system. Currently in the pandemic response, we are experiencing a shift um, where we will be moving away from um, isolation, um, case investigation, not moving away from isolation, but moving away from case investigation and contact tracing that is done by the health department where we're assigning quarantine and isolation and really moving more toward the public holding those activities in their hands, making sure that they understand what to do if they test positive for COVID. The numbers of cases that we're seeing are just rising to the point where it's not effective to, to um, do things in the same way um, as we've been doing things. You can't possibly call all of the people that are you know, being tested for COVID and turning out to be positive. So we need the public to be doing their part as well to contain the transmission and protect our healthcare system in Michigan. So the Health Department of Northwest Michigan, I'll just move my little thing out of the way here. Um, just an overview of how the Health Department looks. We have six divisions and we have a major partnership to provide the staffing and management of our dental clinics. We actually have over 160 employees now and approximately 100 employees in the dental clinics through that partnership. So you have 260 people all together? Yes. Wow. Yes. 
We have a $28.3 million budget with our dental program. This health department was established in 1932. And on my desk upstairs, I have, I have news articles from the 1930s, 40s, and 50s. Yeah, of um, you know, just lots of information about the polio vaccine and all the activities that were happening. If anybody's ever interested in looking at those, someone along the way kept a scrapbook of all of that time. But this partnership has existed since 1932 between Antrim, Charlevoix, Emmett, and Otsego counties. Um, we are governed by a board of health with two representative county commissioners from each partner county. And this health department has long been known for a history of excellence, innovation, and partnerships. Um, we are heavily involved in our regional partnerships, such as the Northern Michigan Public Health Alliance, the Northern Michigan Community Health Innovation Region. And we have long had a um, leadership role in those organizations in um, practicing what we call cross-jurisdictional sharing. And that is just a way of, um, you know, beyond having a partnership between counties to have a district health department, cross-jurisdictional sharing between those health departments helps us to make sure that we have equity and quality of public health services across the region, as well as establishing shared, you know, shared staffing, shared resources, not reinventing the wheel every time someone has a new idea, um, you know, making sure that we can create those efficiencies as well. So we really feel that we are strengthened through those partnerships. Lisa, could you just talk a little more about the dental clinics and where they are? Sure. Open that a little bit. Yeah, Thank yeah, you. yeah, absolutely. So we have eight dental clinics um, in our system of dental clinics. Um, and I'll go from the top. They're in Sheboygan, Harbor Springs, um, East Jordan, Gaylord, Mancelona, Alpena, West Branch. Did I get them Traverse City. Traverse City. And Beaver Island. Oh, nine. And Beaver Island, yes. <laughs> Beaver Island is a new site. <laughs> yeah, thank you, thank you. Um, the dental clinics are completely self-supporting. So they are supported on billable revenue. There's no source of funding for the dental clinics. We don't use any local appropriations for the dental clinics. Is there a sliding scale or something? We, we do have a small sliding scale. We do have a break in... The, the, the last couple of years have been tricky with the size of scale because of the loss of revenue that the dental clinics experienced during the pandemic. There were you know, several months that they had to be closed when all of the closures were happening. And, and we certainly, you know, our dental clinics suffered along with all of the other businesses that were closed during that time. They've made an amazing comeback from that. This year, the challenge has been staffing, just like restaurants and, you know, hospitality industry and other industries, we are experiencing short staffing and people leaving and people being out sick or, you know, quarantined and things like that. But um, they, they, we have a separate fund balance for dental. So if we ever, um, if our expenses ever exceed our revenue, that um, we make that up in the dental fund balance. If our revenue exceeds our expenses, it goes into the dental fund balance. It's an assigned fund balance. So we'll go over that when we go over financing a little more. Lisa, one, one other question. Uh, same with Dell. Was the dental program in place in, let's say, the 30s and 40s? Or was that strictly through the state? The dental program was started in 1991, right? 96. Okay. 96. Thanks, Jane. Jane's our fourth longest standing employee. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, how many? 30? 30 years? 31. No, 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 26. 26 years. I knew a gentleman that was <laughs> and it was he was paid out of the state, but I didn't know what the department was in the 30s and 40s. He traveled in northern Michigan. Ah. And uh, he traveled by boat and also by uh, uh, Model wow. Yeah. Wow. I just wondered if that was part of that. Yeah. yeah, the dental clinics, as we know them now, started in 1991, but certainly oral health has always been a concern of public health. So he might be in my scrapbook upstairs. You can come up to my office and see it if you want to. But um, we, we, we've we had a long history with the dental clinics. Um, one thing that we learned, and I think I talked about this at the last meeting, is that it, we learned that it's, it's easier to have a system than it is to have one dental clinic. That's why each health department doesn't necessarily have their own dental clinics. It's a very specialized type of business. And um, it takes some, some dedicated resources in learning how to do it. 
which is the reason that we contract with Dental Clinics North, the staffing organization, because they are dental expert experts. I'm not a dentist, you know. So um, it, it definitely works better to have a system, and we've definitely experienced that this year. When we have a, like East Jordan and Mancelona, for a time this year, we were so short on staff that we had to close each of them one day a week, but we were able to keep them open by the staff going back and forth. So we have to get creative. Fever Island is a new site. We are so lucky to have a hygienist who lives on the island. And so she works under the PA 161 program, which allows her to provide services without a dental a dentist on site. And then our dental director, Dr. Koyster, goes over there twice a month, twice a month, once a month to um, provide dentist services um, on Beaver Island. So, so thanks for those questions. Well, you know, we can go into more detail and do a whole presentation on that at one point if you'd like. I apologize, I do not have the uh, org chart, but I can- It is in your packet. Oh, okay. So if you look at, um, right after Lisa's written and we'll Page numbers on them. Got it. Yeah, Lisa, if you go to your, um, you got it. Yeah, I could. Thank you. So, if you look at the leadership chart, and I'll look at the one that says leadership chart first, I think it's the one most of you have in front of you. It just describes the, the relationship between the four counties and each of the two commissioners representing the four counties and how that those boards interact with the administration of the health department. Health officer and medical director, um, Dr. Meyerson and myself, um, and normally a deputy health officer. We have a vacancy in that position right now, um, hopefully soon to be filled. We, um, we provide the, the administrative oversight and the medical oversight um, for the health department. Dr. Meyerson and I work in very close partnership um, because we both have different areas of um, expertise and both, um, you know, all of the health factors and all of the administrative factors of the health department is something that we oversee. The Northern Michigan Public Health Alliance I mentioned earlier, and we just list a couple of examples here um, of that cross-jurisdictional sharing that we do. One of those is the, the contract between the other health departments um, that for pr provision of administrative services. Dr. Meyerson, um, provides services through a contract to both District Health Department Number Four and Benzie Lilana, and I provide administrative services to Benzie Lilana through that same contract. And then over on the right, the organ or the associated nonprofit organizations, um, Northern Health Foundation is a nonprofit organization that helps us um, provide our public health facilities. They own many of our buildings, and um, we work with them whenever. Um, we're considering, you know, opening service somewhere. They've built many of our dental clinics. They've built many of our health department buildings, and they they work on a design build process. They find they they have a relationship with the bank where they typically do their financing, and then um, we enter into a long term lease with them. So typically they own the building. We lease it on a long term basis. Any tenants rent from us, and then at the end of the financing term, when we have paid off the building the building typically reverts to the county. And then the county takes possession of the building, which we have maintained and paid for throughout the years. And um, typically they let us stay, which is great. Um, we've worked through a couple of reversions in the last couple of years, one in Emmett, one in Charlevoix. We're working on Antrim right now um, that will revert in April. And um, so it's been a, a, good, a good organization to work with. They have done only work with us. They work with entities, governmental entities all over the state. Dow Clinics North, I've already talked about. And then the Northern Michigan Health Consortium is another um, nonprofit arm of public health and serves as a neutral entity sometimes when we're doing things together. So the Northern Michigan Community Health and in Innovation Region is really expanding now. It involves several health departments, it started with 10 counties, it's moving to 31. And um, what MDHHS, the, the funding that MDHHS provides for us through that program, um, they prefer that it go through the nonprofit and then the nonprofit contracts those funds out to the health departments to provide the services versus MDHHS having to contract with each health department. It assures that we do things in the same way, that we keep our quality consistent. And to them, it's almost like having one organization. 
And then we go down into our staff. Um, only five divisions are listed here. We call dental, and when I say we have six divisions, I, I also mean the dental services. It's not a division in that we have separate staff or a separate director for it. I work in oversight of the dental division on the health department side. Terry, as the CFO, also works um, very closely with the dental um, clinics and our staff and leadership, and we, we work really closely together. Each of our directors you have met, they each um, lead a division. And then if you flip to the next page, you can see a lot more detail about the programs and services that fall under those divisions. So I won't talk any more about the org chart unless people have questions. So I'll just say that I sent a note in this afternoon after I was going through all this stuff and I said, I'd like to visit some of these facilities and your assistant said she dealt with that. And I'm just going to tell others in case others for any reason want to either do it at the same time or just think about it as an option to do. We would be more than happy to work with that for any of you. We'd love to show off our services and our staff and we would love it if you um, wanted to visit. So just let us know. We're happy to help coordinate. Okay, so I will flip through those two. So the screen has to catch up with me here. Okay, that's weird. The screen's up. Oh, there we go. Sorry. So the local governing entity, the Board of Health, you um, have some very specific responsibilities under the public health code, as do I, as the health officer, as does Josh as the medical director. And so um, just a few examples of the um, responsibilities of the local governing entity is that um, some examples of how you would exercise that um, responsibility is you are responsible for approving the budget and providing funds to the health department. Um, the, the state um, requires that the counties provide public health services and you have entered into a partnership together with other counties and have created this board of health. And so we have a separate budget from any single county and you um, just approved that budget in September. Um, we typically bring one amendment um, toward the end of the year um, and then everything else. Um, and when we bring that amendment, we also bring uh, the, the new budget, the initial budget for the following year. So that usually happens close to September. You establish local health regulations and fees. We work our fees into our budget each year. So again, that's addressed in September. Um, local health regulations, one great example of local health re regulation that was adopted by the Board of Health was our, is our district sanitary code that took the agreement of all four counties. And um, it's a long process to adopt a regulation, um, but it's a really important process with public input and input from the counties and agreement between the counties and um, that ordinance is yours. Um, you are responsible for appointing the health officer as the um, administrator for the agency. And you are responsible for approving the plan of organization. Um, our plan of organization is very long and we submit it every three years in preparation for our accreditation process. So the last time that we did that was in 2019. And I didn't send it to you because it's very long, but I have it if anybody would like a copy or would like to see a digital copy of it. The local health department has several requirements under the public health code as well. Um, and these, this listing um, are some of the things that we are required by law to do. Um, the public health code is not the only law that we, um, that we act under. There are several different um, administrative laws and rules that we work under. Um, I will, at, at one point, we're going to break this orientation up into a few different sections. Um, probably the next meeting, we'll talk about financing and the meeting after that, we can dive a little deeper into services that are required. Um, you hear a lot about the eight essential public health services, which are funded by the state of Michigan in the state budget. Um, those are certainly not the only mandated services. Um, basic plus required plus essential equals mandated services. So um, there's a whole matrix that I will go through with you um, on another day. But we are required to have a plan of organization. We are required to address community needs, current community needs. 
you will hear more about the My Thrive Community Health Needs Assessment. That is a 31 county community needs assessment that Jane and her team coordinate um, across the 31 counties in Northern Lower Michigan. Hospitals are also required to do that. And in our current um, situation, the hospitals actually um, provide funding to us to coordinate that, that assessment. And then everybody uses the same assessment to meet all their different requirements. It's taken a lot of years and a lot of coordination to get everyone on the same schedule, but it, it ends up being some really robust data that, um, that really helps us to move forward in, in addressing community needs. Um, we are required to report regularly on services to you. That's why we provide presentations like this at the Board of Health meetings, why we provide written reports from all of our directors so that we keep you informed about the services the health department provides. We are required to implement and enforce laws. We are required to participate in an accreditation process. It is paused right now for the during the pandemic, um, but they could resume it at any time. We would normally be due again in this year, 2022. So we'll see. Um, Just as I mentioned, it is not your job to write laws, implement laws. And I'm leaving, but it was found unconstitutional yesterday. We've had enough. We have had enough. Madam Chair, can we call the meeting to order? Yes. Like I said, I'm leaving, but it's not your job to write lots. It's not. Excuse me. Um, um, so <coughs> the uh, accreditation, we've been in the top accreditation in the last uh, several rounds. Yes. We've, we've achieved a level of which the state has come to recognize that consistently. So um, I don't know if anybody's been through accreditation or you've been through the uh, audit process for services. Uh, it's a pretty involved process. It goes through all your policies and procedures. And then when you get to, um, it, then it tests out your policy procedures. It looks through all of your uh, documentation, make sure everything is initialed, everything is reviewed, um, that everybody's doing their job. And so it's a rather lengthy process for any medical department. Um, so, and we fall within that. So the same thing with the hospitals have to go through. Yes. Um, and if anybody wishes to see any of our recent accreditation reports, we do receive a report from the state, a detailed report. We, we are always happy to provide those. And then the other requirement of um, the public health code is that the leadership of the local health department must include a qualified health officer and medical director that also have to be approved by Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. And they require that we have specific qualifications. Um, so the role of the health officer, which should be coming along any second here, I have a, a delay in my screen. <laughs> oh, there we go. Um, the, health, the health officer is appointed by the Board of Health. Um, I was appointed in um, the fall of 2016 and started my role in February of 2017, replacing Linda Yara. Um, the health officer acts as the chief executive officer of the local health agency and is responsible, like I said, for the administrative functions of the department. Um, health officer leads the administrative team um, who carry out all of the health department <coughs> operations. I think one thing that's so unique about our, our leadership team is that each of our division directors is an expert in their fields. And um, they have years and years of experience providing the services that they oversee and the functions that they oversee. And they've each built some amazing teams within their divisions. Um, our, our public health professionals are top notch. Um, the health officer has explicit authority and responsibility related to protecting the public, public's health, which we've talked and heard a lot about this year. Um, the health officer partners with the medical director in administering public health services. And when we talk about that explicit authority and responsibility, um, it could be used in many different ways. Um, often, you know, we could issue, it could be used to issue a public health alert to notify the public about public health risks. Um, it could be used to in isolate infectious disease, which we're hearing lots about these days with isolation and quarantine. Um, could be used to declare a public health emergency. Um, there are times that we have to prohibit um, habitation in cases of unsafe sewage disposal. 
Um, and school exclusions and closures are always part of our world when it comes to communicable disease. And that is a relationship that really depends on the, the close relationship between the school and the health department. Um, the health department rarely closes a school. Um, usually it's a, a decision of the school based on advice of the health department and through that relationship we talk a lot. Especially these, these years, we have lots of conversations with our school leaders. And then the medical director, I'm going to let Josh talk about his role. And I think we can go right into it, Josh. Just go right yeah. into it. Okay. Well, um, you, I uh, put in uh, put together um, a report for you in the packet um, that just kind of, you know, outlines. And I've been asked, you know, why, why do health departments have a medical director? What do you do besides drink coffee? And, um, you know, and, and questions about what I do. And it really is... is um, uh, it's it's a great job. I love my job. It's and it's um, it has a, a you know a wide breadth of things that that I get involved in, and I think that's one of the things that uh, attracts me to it. But um, each local health department, it's you know it's by state law it must have either a medical health officer or far more common in the state is a medical director who works with uh, an administrative health officer. And the qualifications are set by the public health code. It's in the law about uh, the qualifications that you have to be to serve as a medical director um, in the state of Michigan, which includes work in public health and, and appropriate degrees and licensures. Um, and um, I think, you know, the, in a general sense, I really kind of oversee everything that's done here from in providing that medical input, the clinical input. And it, it can be, um, you know, very direct as far as overseeing, uh, working as the medical director, overseeing the clinical work that we do with our nurse practitioners and the many programs that we do, um, and writing standing orders for things like immunizations and our uh, treatment of uh, sexually transmitted infections, our reproductive health, and uh, um, uh, our, you know, orders for screening for cancer, like in our uh, cancer screening programs. But um, it's also just, um, I think, a lot is to provide that medical background, to provide that understanding to our staff, um, as well as to the community um, about potential public health threats that sometimes can be hard to, under, hard to understand. Um, and I say that like in the sense with environmental health, whether it's PFAS or TCE or, or all sorts of different um, mold issues, uh, radon issues, people have a hard time sometimes um, and it's taken, you know, it can take time to figure that out. What, what are, what is the risk mean? What is that actual risk? Um, and when you look at our, our state and federal regulatory authorities, they often talk in, you know, um, you know, allowable levels, regulated levels, and people want to know, but is it going to hurt me? You know, that's what they want to know. And, and what does that mean? And what's the dose? And what's the duration? And what's the impact to me or my children or my, my wife who's pregnant? So a lot of that is trying to provide that, um, you know, physician clinical understanding and that background um, that, that can help whether when we're talking about risk from a foodborne outbreak or an infectious disease outbreak or again, uh, an environmental health threat. Um, and I think to me, that's a big part of, of my role is, as well as advocating for public health, um, whether it's in the local community or, or advocating with our state and federal um, uh, collaborators. The, uh, there was a whole work group put together a few years ago um, on looking at um, the, some of the issues with you know, trying to standardize um, uh, job description, so to speak, and what does a medical director really need to do and, when, when health departments start recruiting, what should they look at? And that public health medical director core functions, um, I took that from a, a document that was produced through, this was through the Michigan Association of Local Public Health and the Michigan uh, MDHHS or the whole work group. And that more or less um, kind of goes through all of the different job functions that, that a medical director would be called upon to do. And knowing that, Every health department is a little different. And how I serve in my role here um, is different than how I serve at Benzie Leland on. It's different at District 4, and it would be different than um, the medical director, um, say, in Ingham County, where they, they're also a federally qualified health center. And they, they, what they do day to day may be different than what I do. And, 
and that took me a few years uh, to learn um, that each health department is unique and then uh, requires uh, you know differences in, in what I do day to day. But there's also um, clearly the core essential things that that are consistent amongst the different health departments. So I listed. I'm sure I forgot some of the things I do in some of the programs, but um, that in a nutshell is is what the role of the medical director is. If you have questions. So thank you to all of you. We appreciate your time and service and, and listening and learning. And we look forward to 2022. Any questions? Quick question. Yeah. Again, I'm the, I'm the novice now. Okay. For, for Dr. Ryerson, you say that your position would be different in different regions of the state. How do you, how do you how did you come to do what you're doing here rather than, let's say, Ingham County? Is there different demands placed on the medical director? Or? Yeah, I, um, well, I'd say, I mean, well, for one instance where it's different is we have child and adolescent health centers here. Um, so I'm the medical director because of, of the, uh, the Blue Devil Wellness Center at the Gaylord High School and the uh, Ironman Health Center in our uh, in Salona. Uh, family resource center so that requires me to really be and, and you know I, my background is pediatric so i was excited about that but but i'm overseeing you know all the clinical work that's done there and i've seen clients there and i need to do chart review um in district four they don't have a uh, clinical and uh, a child and adolescent health center so that would not be something that would be required of the medical director there um so maybe a slightly a slightly different skill set uh, would be needed. I think, you know, someone here, if you're going to do a lot of telemedicine health, would be good. You, you would need to have a medical director that would be qualified to serve in that regard as well. Um, you might not want to hire an internal medicine person, um, which, which might be better suited in, in other places. But the main reason I'm here is because uh, I live here. I live in Emmett County and I love Northern Michigan. And, so, the, uh, so the demands are different in different regions. So. Slightly, yes. I mean, the core functions of the medical director, you know, are spelled out, and the, the, the mandated and all the basic and essential services are similar amongst, you know, different health departments. So, in that sense, the medical directors, there's a lot of similarities, but um, there can, you know, each each health department is unique, and, which is why they are local health departments. They can serve the unique needs of those communities. Okay, one last one, then I'll show up. But uh, do you oversee them the hospitals in this region, or do you have any interaction with the hospitals? No, I think it's an important role in my job is to be that liaison between the health department and the medical community, you know, doctor to doctor, so more or less. So it's very important that the hospitals are their own um, very complicated and, and very large organizations, and they have their own, uh, you know, chief medical officers that. That, and, and you know, obviously, all of the medical faculty and the nurses and all the people that work with them. So um, we don't have we we aren't directly tied into them, but it's important that we work closely uh, with them. And in the last two years, I'd say we worked closer with them than ever before, having weekly meetings. Um, which which I hope that collaboration and that work together. I, I hope that that will continue on because it could be really helpful in a lot of ways. Thank you. Um, just on the on his report at the bottom that you see in community health, he talks about the child and adolescent health. Um, he oversees all of our clinics, just those clinics. And so um, in order for us to operate as a clinic, you have to have a, uh, a medical professional that um, you can you can accept Medicaid, Medicare, and insurance providers. So then mainly uh assistance for the health departments here or a particular health department not necessarily a regional every health department has to have a medical director in order to provide those yeah. essential services okay thank you and so immunizations is an essential service mm -hmm. so without having a medical director you couldn't do that service and then you'd be out of compliance with the law and then also um environmental in the environmental division, he oversees any foodborne illness because we would then do contact tracing. So if, if there was a foodborne illness outbreak, 
um, Dr. Meyerson oversees that and works with our environmental director to contact and isolate and to take care of that. Correct me if I'm wrong. But I think with foodborne illness, it's really a, you really need you need a lot of experts. You need the environment, the food sanitarians who really know and understand food safety and, and risk from food. And, and then you work with our communicable disease nurses who are really good at interviewing patients to find out what their symptoms are. Because you don't know what caused the outbreak. You're trying it's a it's an investigation. It's it's a um, it's you know. Um, something that, that you have to look into. It's a mystery that needs to be solved. And my role in that is to really, um, again, look at, okay, what are the symptoms? What are the likely things to help create hypotheses of what the probable culprits are and help design the interviews and help make sure we test the right things for the right sorts of uh, uh, organisms that could be the cause of the outbreak and to help look at that data and, and, and the um, the results of it to, to come up with conclusions. So, but it's really, it takes a team to do that. One of the interesting things we found are, over my years being on the board is um, when we do have a foodborne outbreak, a lot of people say, oh, I must have gotten food poisoning or something was off at the picnic I went to or whatnot. Um, they don't report that, they just work through it. But once we see hospitalizations um, and for common things, then it gets, um, collated and moved to the health department to the, wherever that might be, then they start that, but they alert the health department. It's much later than um, what we'd like, obviously, but until they see cases, we don't know. Lisa, do you have anything else for your report? I don't, unless anyone has questions about COVID stuff, if you want me to provide any kind of an update, I can. But if, if you feel like we've been getting the information regularly enough and I don't need to, that is fine too. Um, just a few things. There was a uh, news release, oh, I want to say the end of December maybe, and it had a graphic that was attached that kind of gave you the guidelines if you have tested and you've been vaccinated and you had exposure, what do you do? How long, you know, if you were wearing a mask, if you weren't wearing a mask. So it kind of gives you the scenarios that are common in the workplace and also at the schools um, provided by the CDC, but it uh, kind of gave a description. We had a lot of requests from businesses with the changes that have been going on with Omicron. Um, so just so you know, I don't know if it's been posted elsewhere, but it was very helpful to those who did get a hold of it as far as with their employees, because a lot of businesses have had employee assets. Um, and then there's other uh, resources available on the website, but I just want to make everybody aware that there are graphics um, available. If anybody has any questions, always feel free to reach out um, because a lot of times uh, I found that they're there, sometimes they're just buried in all of the information. So we want to make sure if there's a useful graphic or useful something um, that we get it out there for folks that are um, looking. Jaris. Do we have any rough idea of, I don't know which point this might help, but do we have any rough idea about what percent of Northern Michigan has had COVID now? Take a step, step, rough step. I would, uh, I would say, I mean, we know that that's a big underestimate. Um, and you could probably double that. And if our case counts, it would probably put us um, over 20% for sure. Um, and it could certainly be higher than that. It could be right. I think 40%. I think with this current surge, um, you're, yes. Yeah. Yes, I think a lot of people are um, getting COVID. Sure. They, this MDHHS compiled some year-end data for 2021 recently. They do those data and modeling updates every week. And um, the data they compiled said that one in 10 people in Michigan had had COVID. Um, Just in 2021. With, right. Yeah with positive tests and the increases that we've seen just in the beginning of 2022 have been just exponential, you know, right. and nothing that we've seen yet. So um, one in 10 positive, tested positive for COVID, one in 100 were hospitalized, one in 1,000 died. So those were the year end stats from all of the data that all of the health departments collected throughout 2021. Would you say that again, one in 10 tested positive 
Yeah. One in a hundred were hospitalized. Correct. And one of the thousand died. Died. Okay. Thank you. But, and if you took, if you look at the Michigan dashboard of the number of cases reported since it started, it's more around eighteen or nineteen percent. But we're now seeing, unfortunately a lot of people who it's their second round of, of COVID. So, uh, you know, the, the thought that you only would get it once is unfortunately not uh, the case. So um, some of those are going to be doubled up. Do we have a number about how many, what percent that is? I know I asked that a month or so. Who, as far as what? The how twice? many, how, what percentage have had it twice? Or? I think that's a good question. And I think it'll take time because I think we're really starting to see that more with Omicron. So I think, you know, in, in uh, you know, a report where we actually have reported and documented second cases, um, I would think we might have some something we could share with you statewide, but it's going to be a few months. I've not seen any reports on that. I'm seeing, I'm just hearing it from our CB uh, people and uh, our investigators that they're seeing people that, you know, had, were sick, tested positive back in October, November, and now they're sick again. And then it's been reported that Omicron is, is um, affecting children more than previous. Area. Is, are we seeing that here or? I think it's just so contagious that it's, we're seeing a lot of people <coughs> and a lot of children um, getting it. But I think that the current data is showing the high, the groups with the highest rates of COVID disease right now are that 20 to 29 and then 30 to 39 by uh, year age. I'm not sure what happened to our screen, Jen's checking out it, but I, oh. I was going to show you a couple of, of slides, but um, yeah, the pediatric um, hospitalizations reached a, a peak for the pandemic over the past week. So they're off. I will show you. There we go. It's fixing it. I see the T viewer. Let's see if I can share. This is some information that um, that was shared with us today from the state chief medical officer, but you can see this is the, the pediatric hospitalizations are at an all time high here um, and a sharp increase, you know, just, but again, the volume that we're seeing of cases, just, it's, 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 it's going to be more of everyone. Um, and then the other slide that I wanted to show you was- I'm not allowed to ask a question about the pediatric We'll allow one question. Please don't be belligerent. I've just read in the news that some of these pediatric admissions are not for COVID, that they get admitted with a broken leg, they test positive for COVID, and that's part of the numbers. Do we know what those numbers reflect that you had up on the screen? From what I hear from our uh, colleagues that, that run the pediatric ICUs and the pediatric hospitals, their their beds are full. They're they're taking care of more children sick with COVID respiratory disease primarily than they ever have. So I would say the increase there is 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 a reflection of children who are hospitalized because of COVID. Do you know that for a fact? I do not know for a fact on that slide. Yes, there are just like adults, there are people, lots of people in the hospital who had a car accident, they tested and are positive for COVID. But when 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 I'm hearing from when, when I have conversations with the hospitals, they're talking about people who are there who wouldn't be there if they didn't have COVID. So I'm an engineer too. I'm just curious about the numbers that you showed me. That's all. It's all of the data is available on the MDHHS website. This if you go to Michigan.gov slash coronavirus. You can go down to. I'm very familiar with it. Okay, so it's under the state data and modeling updates that are done. Right, but this question, I'm not sure is the answer. Is it? Answer? I, I, you know, I'm not sure, but there are footnotes for all of the data, so if they get their sources. I appreciate the chance to talk. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. So this is just the, the other slide that I wanted to show you. This is the kind of overview of the approach and um, you know how we approach the pandemic going forward um, in 2022 with three main priorities, number one being to prevent death and se severe outcomes. So, you know, working on protecting the most vulnerable, especially looking at congregate settings and making sure that 
people have early access to testing and therapeutics, um, as well as prioritizing the updates or the uptake of vaccination and booster doses so that when people do get COVID, they don't become severely ill or die. Um, number two, protecting the healthcare capacity. Our healthcare capacity is very, very strained right now and has been for a sustained period of time. Um, and their data and modeling is expecting to see that we haven't reached the peak yet and that we will likely be seeing that peak later this month or maybe in early February and that it will take several weeks to come down from that peak. They're concerned about it because the hospitals are already strained and then reaching the peak could take them over the edge. And so protecting healthcare capacity is something all of us need to do. And um, reducing community spread, it means that we all need to understand when we need to isolate, when we need to stay away from other people and what we can do to prevent further community transmission, as well as reducing the severity of cases. And we do that through early treatment and vaccination. And then third, keeping vital infrastructure functioning. We've all talked about the difficulties in different ways that we encountered when things were shut down, the impact on the economy, the impact on mental health, the impact on children's education. It's huge. We can't afford to do that. You know, we can't see that happen again. And so schools, local government, the economy, keeping all of that going. Um, and so really looking at this concept of a risk budget, what risk are we willing to accept? Because we aren't going to run away from COVID. We're not going to it's not going to go away. We're not going to stand it out, but we have to figure out, you know, what is the level of risk that is acceptable? And it depends on a lot of things. But part of the approach now, like I said earlier, is putting many of these tools into the hands of the public and really, um, you know, being available to support them and guide them and help them to know how they can protect themselves, including access to over the counter testing and instructions and making sure that people know what to do when they get that positive test. So Lisa, I'll stop. Uh, Lisa okay. uh, our county has uh, a medical care facility, an ambulance service, and a jail. Mm -hmm. All three, if I understand correctly, are affected rather significantly. Do you have any thoughts about any of those or all of those? I was talking to the sheriff recently who said that they have reduced the number of people that are incarcerated. So what they have is people that really need to be incarcerated mm -hmm. and they can't, they don't interact uh, externally at all with work release because they're just not qualified. So there's an issue there, but do you have any observations in general here you with Josh about those three areas? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if you don't, that's fine. I'm just curious. I think they're all, I mean, I, I think a, a lot of those and, and all, you know, across the sector, people are struggling to maintain their staff um, when they start having a lot of people, a lot of people are just going out sick. Um, so I know it's a, it's a, a constant struggle with the hospitals. It's an everyday thing. Uh, it's the same in the long-term care facility that, you know, the people are there, they, they can't, it's there, you know, they, you can't just discharge someone in a nursing home. And you got to have someone help take care of them. And so I know well, and we can't a take a struggle. The same thing, yes, the jails. And, and you know, I, I'd like to have, you know, police, if I dial 911, I'd like to have someone there. And, uh, ambulances, that's been a real issue with with uh, having, you know, some, some of the times that some of the problems with in healthcare has been. Um, they have people waiting to get transferred from a hospital to a hospital that can provide greater need, but they don't have anyone, uh, there's no ambulance person to take them there. So well, I understand Bay Bluffs is rejecting any transfers from Northern Michigan Hospital because they don't have staff. Uh -huh. And uh, they'd have to open another wing and they don't have staff for that. And so they're rejecting it. So Northern Michigan has got a stack of people that right. we'd like to have. So, okay, that's fine. Thank you. Questions? I don't have questions, but I have some that's really stretchy. Um, right now, we have a lot of uh, uh, paramedics, mm -hmm. you know, the EMTs. We got a lot of them on the line now sitting at home. My son's sitting at home. He's screaming. His wife was a head nurse at the hospital. She's sitting at home. And their 18 year old grandson, he's there. And I haven't seen any of them, thank God, you know. But during Christmas, I had the family came in, and when they went to down the Grand Rapids, they have it. I mean, so it's spreading like wildfire. Mm -hmm. and there's nothing we can do about it. I, you know, I try to stay away as much as I can, but I'm saying that they're just getting wrapped out of the yeah. Yeah. 
Yes, there's okay. nobody to go. If you, you can call them, but they call from everywhere. This is somebody to go pick up somebody. Mm -hmm. And it's mad out there. Okay. That's what we have. Any other questions? Hearing none, we'll move on to written reports. Um, the directors are, if they're not in the room, they're on Zoom. Okay. So we have Community Health Director Kathleen. Dang it, I try every time. I'm sorry. Um, she did a health division orientator overview. Um, some of the highlights it falls under three main categories of work child and adolescent health, substance use prevention, and health promotion and education. The services under health, uh, the child and adolescent health program are aimed at achieving the best possible physical, intellectual, and emotional status of the children and adolescents by providing services that are high quality, accessible, and acceptable to youth. And we have several um, youth based health clinics within the schools. <coughs> They also have the Substance Use Prevention Program, which is comprised of coalitions providing education and schools, presentations in our community's policy system and environmental change, alcohol retailer education, and tobacco retailer education, as well as their SAFE program, which works directly with the children um, in the schools and educating their peers in the um, use of substance abuse. And then um, the health education and health promotion work is aimed to blend individual interventions and policy system and environmental changes. One other um, item to note is that the emergency preparedness coordinator is also responsible to coordinate planning, facilitate community partnerships, and act as a point of contact for public health emergency support, which is also under that program. Are there any questions? Next one is from Amanda Thompson, the Family Health uh, Division Overview. I believe this is our biggest division. Yeah. It consists of the direct client contact services through over 25 clinical programs. The, one of the primary goals in family health is to provide client-centered services, focusing on breaking down barriers and allowing all clients, no matter their circumstances, to have equal access us to health care services, which speaks directly to our mission statement of health equity. So there are several examples there. You'll see in the organizational chart all the different programs that they have. Any other questions? Family health. Nope. The environmental health program, this is what the public is most familiar with us for. Um, we do food inspections, we do substance <laughs> well inspections, we do have a um, public health code for uh, septic and well. We also have a lab now that's under that regional lab, uh, under that overall. They do beach monitoring. Uh, they inspect the body art and tattoo uh, facilities. Um, communicable disease, um, air quality. So we've had some of that with the um, laundry facilities um, with vapor intrusion. And so that's been um, brought to us several times in the past and PFAS that's been brought to us as well. So those are two current issues as well as um, uh, community well systems because the water is inadequate in certain areas. Um, Antrim County has a shale um, that prevents some areas from being able to maintain or to get a proper well. And so uh, they've worked with how to work with communities and providing a safe system. Any questions on environmental services? Like I said, most people are familiar with what we do on that division. There. Jane, this is the one that you read too much for me, but the <laughs> <laughs> planning division overview. There are the Northern Michigan Public Health Alliance, Northern Michigan Community Health Innovation Region, Community Health Needs Assessment Improvement Planning, cross jurisdictional 
sharing, all of those have different districts. So it might be 31 counties, it might just be within our, um, our district. It might incorporate um, just the side of the state. It might incorporate just the northern half of the state. So each program is different based on those structures. Jane, if you want to highlight anything in your report that I didn't hit on. No, I think you covered covered them. I just like to um, point out that our division is all about public health 3.0 which we should maybe talk about sometime with the board because it really is the next future of public health. Okay. Oh, the so, 3.0 looks at the social determinants of health. So if you don't have access to care because you don't have transportation, you don't have housing, you don't have um, <laughs> service providers in your area, if I'm wrong, you can correct me, please. No, no, you that that we, can, we can provide high quality service, but if we're not providing it to those who need it, then it does us no good. And so what they do is do community assessments. Your hospitals are involved in that as well. The different regions involve different hospitals. But we do assessments and, and find out what is um, the barriers to health within our community and then work with different partnerships such as <coughs> aging, aging, area agency on aging, which is the 10 county district, which we're all, I believe we're all members of. I'm not positive about SIGO if we're in the same district. Um, county transportation, working to see if we can do vouchers through different programs. And then we work with um, different community foundations. Um, we uh, had high success and in, in they find a program, they work with us on identifying, you know, where they can find programming to help and um, and where can they fit into that whole structure. Um, sometimes it's just a policy change. Sometimes it takes some, some other entity to work out um, and, and collaborate with. Did I do it okay? I just yes. thought, can I just throw in one thing? Sure. Another part of public health 3.0 that's really important is convening the role of public health and convening um, community partners to mobilize action. And Jane and her group does that, that is very much what they focus on. And one example of that is our community health needs assessment. Um, just we just you know compiled the data and have the results of that. And the top need that emerged across the 31 county region and in every subregion was behavioral health, which I'm sure does not surprise any of you. Um, and so, you know, in response to that already, um, Jane and many, many, many partners across the region, community mental health, DHS, all of our community foundations, lots and lots of partners across the region convened a behavioral health summit meeting in November where they developed um, 15 different action groups that are working on different action plans to address behavioral health on two major levels, one being access to services and making sure that, that there's equitable and adequate access, access to behavioral health services. Um, and the other one being building resilience in communities. So moving upstream with that prevention so that hopefully someday maybe we won't need as many services and that we can build strong communities from the inside out. And so they met with the governor today in Traverse City who had heard about their work and um, is really excited about expanding that concept um, further. And, and and also funding some of it. So James had an exciting day. I did. <laughs> if, if you get home at uh, 6 30 or watch maybe even tomorrow morning, Jane might be on um with the nine, 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 ten, ten news was nine, nine, ten ten news. So yeah. give her a plug for that. Yeah. She did a great she's done a she's an amazing convener <laughs> and leader. Any questions for Jane? All right, and then the Administrative Services Division, headed by Terry Tallis, provides a backfill for the agency by way of service support in the areas of finance and accounting, billing, information technology, human resources, office coordination, and administrative support. Little bit of everything to run it, to keep it, and hold it together. And I don't know if you wanted to offer anything more in your division. I mean, most people understand yeah, that. I think people, that, that's pretty uniform across, the, <laughs> across <laughs> businesses. Um, again, prior, we, we, we kind of evolved this position. It didn't used to be a CFO position. 
Um, but we found that, you know, as things evolve, that it made sense to have somebody oversee that. Um, you fell into it when it was already established, I believe. Um, but it was, it's a position that has evolved over the years. And uh, to manage all of the budgetary requirements for each division, given the amount of grants that we participate in and how we have to account for all of the hoops that those require um, is a real feat. And so um, you witness some of that if you're on the, um, the personnel and finance committee, um, but certainly you'll see some of that once we get into more financials um, of how that kind of all pulls together. And then information technology being under that is one more there. Yeah, and we, um, if you look at the size and scope of our agency, the budget, the size of the budget and the number of FTEs that we are responsible for, a lot, you know, including dental is really close to some of the big counties down in Southeast Michigan. It's, it's really um, very similar in size and scope and responsibility over a broader area, but um, very similar. And did you have any further um, information to share regarding that position? Anybody else? <laughs> no, she wanted to hear that. So I um, have uh, thought about it for uh, a little while and um, I decided that I'd be going to be covering. Um, so this is my last official work email. Very, very <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. A very rewarding 40 year career. Oh. And then, it's hard. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to miss Terry a lot. She has been an amazing partner. And I went six months without a finance director before she came. <laughs> and uh, that it's a really key role at the agency. And she's just done such an amazing job. And her mark will stay at the health department because she has built an amazing team in her division and um, built up some leadership from within and hired some new staff. And so, you know, she will live on in them for sure. And we're, I'm really excited about the team that she's built. And I'm really sad to see her go, but I always wish everyone well in retirement. And especially when they're, when they're able to retire young enough to, young enough and healthy enough to really enjoy the life that's ahead of them. We wish you the very best. Thank you. Congratulations. I have one more thing, Karen, yeah. just to, I did, I forgot to mention it during my report, but I wondered what you thought about the packets and the way the packets came through this time. I tried to include a lot of links and not separate documents in my report. And um, I, I just wanted to check in with you on electronic reports versus hard copies. Do you want to continue receiving both? Do you, and we can do it any way you want to. The other way we could do it, we do that we do both right now, but we could send it electronically and have hard copies available on request, which we could mail to you. Um, if you get the hard copy and you throw it away, I would love to know that so that we don't have to waste that paper and Jen's effort to put it all together. Um, so just think about that and maybe you can let me know at the end of the meeting what you'd like to do going forward. Lisa, I really like the electronic copy and I'll be quite honest, I like it because I can expand the size of the pipe. <laughs> I know. And uh, for what it's worth, uh, Emmett County a while back uh, decided our board packets were going to be entirely electronic. And so we just bring a computer to the table and open it up. And for me, it's just a big fat PDF and I can scroll through it. And I'm happy with that. I mean, I brought the written one along, but um, so that's just my feedback. Okay. So if anybody would prefer to uh, not receive a written packet, just let Jen know and she'll just send you the electronic. I prefer both. Um, I like to kind of be able to flip through it electronically, see what's on it, scan it, but I read more in depth when it's on paper. So, um, but I also have the ability to hit those links and kind of see what those are and print them all if I need to. Mm -hmm. So just let uh, Jen know. Thank you. Thank you. All right. We have next on the agenda is the personnel and finance committee accounts payable. I'm looking for a motion that the finance or looking for a motion to approve the December bills in the amount of 646 747 74 
and employee expenses of $14,802.44. Do I have a motion to that effect? Shirley, is there a second? So, okay, yeah, second. Okay. Moved and seconded. Any questions? Hearing none, all in favor, roll call, please. Valerio? Yes. Coons? Yes. McInnes? Yes. Graves? Yes. Roloff? Yes. Barbie? Yes. Rubin? Yes. Motion passes. Report from the program and evaluation committee is that what we already talked about. We haven't met since the last time, so. Okay. The next meeting is still scheduled for Monday at 4.30. You're right. Yep. What's the date again? February 17th. No, it'll be uh, January 17th, Monday. Just for the program committee, surely. Uh, oh, you're yeah, you're not you're sure. You are welcome to attend and review, but um, okay. It's January 17th at 10. 4 30. And if you do have any suggestions or any items that you want to discuss, um, please submit them to Jaris or you can submit them to Jen and show them to the committee. Unfinished business. Don't have any. Um, we are going to go into a closed session pursuant to MCL 15.2688 to discuss an attorney client privilege written legal opinion to include Terry Tallis, Lisa Bowler, Ken, Jennifer Kenny, and the members of the board. Is there anyone else that I would need to include? I think I got everybody. So do I have a motion to that effect? I will make that motion. Is there a second? I'll second it. That's been moved and second to move into closed session pursuant to NCL 15.268 to discuss attorney client privilege written legal opinion. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none, roll call, please. Roll up. Yes. Graves. Yes. McGinnis. Yes. Coons. Yes. Calarito. Yes. Rubing. Yes. Barbie. Yes. Motion passes, we'll move into closed session. So if uh, we have those that are not on the list to attend, we're going to shut down the Zoom portion. Um, we do have our attorney joining us on a um, remote. We'll call the meeting back to order. It is 8.18, coming back from closed session. Um, Looking for a motion to direct the attorney to pursue option number one discussed as discussed in closed session. Is there a motion to that effect? Yeah, I'll make that motion. Move to direct legal counsel to pursue option once discussed in closed session. Yeah, I'll make that motion. And I'll second it. It's been moved and second. Um, any discussion? And I'm assuming that because it's closed session. All right, roll call vote, please. Ruby. No. Barbie. Yes. Rolla. Yes. Graves. No. McGinnis. Yes. Kuntz. Yes. Pellerito. No. Motion passes four to three. Yep. Thank you. All right. Any other business to come before the board? I wish Scott well and it gets better soon. All right, then we stand adjourned. Thank you very much for your time, folks. Uh, Next meeting will be the first Tuesday of February, is that correct? Yes, at 4 30. Yes, and then um, just your personnel and finance and the uh, Thank you.